Welcome to a full review here of the Mercedes GLC here on Autogefühl, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars today with Thomas. And besides our normal review, which is already very interesting, I hope at least, <laughs> we also give you actually four more reasons to watch this review today. First of all, this one here is the GLC facelift. That means we'll tell you all about the changes it has here. Second reason is this one is a GLC 300, a very famous, very common petrol engine worldwide. We had the 63 so far in the facelifted version, but this one here, of course, you know, a little bit more relevant to even more buyers. Third reason, we will compare it also a little bit to the BMW X3. I drove that one two days ago, a main competitor of this one here. And I tell you, you know, which one is better in, you know, which field here and there. This will be very interesting. And the fourth one, I also recently drove the GLE, the bigger brother, so let me say it's GLE. To this one and we'll also compare then you know if you think about you know going this or that one what are the differences there so very interesting comparing aspects also in this episode here today mostly i'll comment it during the driving part and also something you know on the interior as well so let's go with everything of that all the information all the fun in full hd full screen and full length let's go Here in the front, we can see main change with the facelift are those new daytime running lights together with new headlamps, standard now LED, optional, the one you can see here, the multi-beam LED for more high beam support. This here in the standard um, line has this dual horizontal fin grille. In the AMG line, it would have this diamond pin grille, which would be my favorite as for the exterior design. Pretty interesting design when it's here, however, in chrome looks pretty elegant interesting with those holes there in the lower part so but you can definitely change the design around just a little bit the big mercedes star is two-dimensional because it hides the sensors and for example also important the autonomous emergency brake is standard but we can also expect that and also the distronic the adaptive cruise control has been updated now with the facelift and there's also a new trailer maneuvering assist 4 meters 65, 15 foot 3 or 183 inches is the length of the GLC SUV. You know it's also available as a GLC Coupe, which would have the main difference and it has a falling roofline right there. Then wheels start from 17 to 19 inch in the normal GLC specs, which you can see here, the 19 inch ones in the AMG line, there's 19 or 20 inch, so a little bigger, and the GLC 63, even goes up to 21 inch which is a very massive for this mid-size suv then we also have this optional side step it's very interesting pretty cool design element even if it's not maybe that practical and it's pretty cool when it has like it's mirrored in the freshly cleaned paint here in the lower part that looks quite fancy then other than that i like it with the elegant chrome frames around the windows and this typical banded l shape that the glc has right there together with some slight strong shoulders of you know overall a very elegant design or what's your take on that in the rear we can now see a modern tail lamp signature here this is definitely fancier so that's the main facelift change gt3 300 batch overall then i think you know not too much screaming out in the rear rather round design and the lower end here this is typical fake exhaust tip there's nothing in it so the real exhaust underneath yeah dirt 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 fake exhaust alien and outer fuel and by the way suspension information there's a standard suspension then a little put higher one for like soft off-road situations for a couple of hundred euros same goes for the sport suspension which goes lower and then more sophisticated su suspension choices adaptive suspension is available for you know a little bit more than a thousand euros extra or dollars and then more than two thousand extra is then the air suspension which is also built in this car here today so there are a couple of other competitors who have that but not so many so this is also one of the you know unique selling points of this car and we'll test that comfort of course later on here we go with the engine yay hydraulic struts love that but i mean for a vehicle that is between 40 and 80k 
we can expect that. So, two liter four cylinder petrol engines like today also. There's a GLC 200 with around 200 horsepower and a GL3 300 with about 250 horsepower. 255 in US, 258 in Europe, so they're different just a little bit. 6.2 seconds is the acceleration figure. And here in the all wheel drive today in the US, it's also available as rear wheel drive. And new with the face of it is that those two engines, the two liter four cylinder engines, come with an MHF system 48 volt board net for more recuperation and also those sailing or coasting functions. Talking about more about that when we drive the car very soon. And Still waiting for the update of the GLC 43. Maybe it's there if you watch the video later on. This one is a 3 liter V6 with 362 horsepower, but that one not facelifted yet at this moment when we record the video. And then already facelifted, also there's a review of that, the GLC 63, the V8 bi-turbo. The 43 also has a bi-turbo, by the way. So the V8 4 liter in the GLC 63 with 476 or on the S version 410 horsepower. And then there are also diesels available, 200D with 163 horsepower, 220D with 194 horsepower and 300D with 245 horsepower. So those ones are diesel then for Europe. And last but not least, there's now also the GLC 300E PHEV, was called 350E before, they changed the name now, so it's a new plug-in hybrid. And really love to test that one at the later stage it's a petrol plug-in hybrid that could be a good alternative for a better fuel economy Now to the interior, we see here high-class Artico leatherette top cover. Then we have a matte wood inlet, which is pretty classic and also sophisticated. Galvanized buttons all over the place. It's a very good build quality and also reasonable door pockets in the lower end. Then today we have a mix of brown and beige for the interior. Yeah, I think that's a matter of taste. <laughs> here you can see the instruments all digital now, optional with this facelift, soon more to that, but you can see that at the moment it's all shut off. And then those seats here, again today in beige, but the animal skin spec, how do you see that? They have a little bit more elements here, those elements you can see there and count. If it would be the Artico sustainable and animal friendly leather red seat, then it would have, I think, five elements in this back part, so that's how you can visually differentiate them. The Artico seat is really high class and in Europe, especially Germany, you can get also a fabric base seat. Then you can get fabric on the inside and leatherette on the outside, which would be an awesome mix. And then also in the US, you can get a full Artico seat. And the cool thing they offer it in black, beige, gray, brown and red. So Mercedes offers one of the widest choices of different, more sustainable interior materials. Really well done as for the choice. And Dynamica on the inside, microfiber and Arctic on the outside would be for the AMG line. Then you have a little bit sportier and a little bit stickier on the seat when you go into those corners. Phew, yeah, so many things to tell you about the seating choices. You should check out the configurator or the, the you know build, how you call it in the US, and just play around with that a little bit. That's really a lot of fun in this case here also with the GLC. The new steering wheel with the facelift, you can see here left side, is for the cruise control now, not a separate column. It's easier to set and also those touch fields. Right button for the right thumb right there. This is then to control the right screen and left thumb, left button for the left screen. This is also new. Now let's get inside, pretty easy entry. You already have an upright SUV seating position, that's cool. Somewhat similar to the BMW X3, as for the height, you know, the overall position and so on. Steering wheel has an electric function here. That's not base, that's an option. So it goes in and out and also up and down quite a lot, actually. Seat control here at the inside of the doors, which is typical, I may say, it's hard to do it while reviewing and while sitting here. Um, if you compare it to the GLE, the GLE bigger, higher, it feels a little bit more open and sophisticated as for that. But just probably know that you have more space. The quality of materials is quite similar in GLC and in GLE. That's different as for the X3 versus X5, where the X5 really has a you know wider span, you know wider 
um, you know, distance to the X3, definitely very interesting. But feeling very, very cozy and comfortable in here. Also because you can put the you know, seating area a little bit um, longer here. And if you have different seat cover, by the way, it won't change necessarily the seat form. There are different seat forms also available. Um, but then this one here, the very same, same seat form is also available and with different material. So overall, very good impression at first and a little bit more sophisticated in general to the pre-facelift because of this new steering wheel and also the screens we have here. And we'll, of course, turn them on when we have the rear cockpit perspective from behind. So welcome to this interior. Let's turn everything on. You start with analog gauges on the left and optional those full digital 12.3 inch now with the facelift and on the right side you start with a smaller 7 inch screen and optional this 10.25 inch screen and both feature the MBUX, this new voice input system where you can for example say, hey Mercedes, How may I help drive you? me to Berlin. I am starting route guidance to Berlin. So that's really perfect. You can change temperature, turn on and off head-up display, even open and close the sunroof and so on. The best system there is on the market and BMW on uh, uh, you know, place two at the moment. Route. So um, that, that they're new in the, only in the big cars, not in the X3. Um, so the new BMW natural voice input system, also pretty cool. So that's one thing. Soon more deals to each of those screens. And again here, the steering wheel, which is a little bit more you know fancy than before, volume control here on the right side and here with my right thumb I can control the right screen and you can also see how that works but the redundant controls I can also do it like here with a touch or touch screen is of course also one of the new big news and then here in the lower console I can use this touchpad um, that's also an option um, and I can write an address there too this is possible and then with the left thumb I can control stuff here in the digital instruments and also change the styles and so on. So overall pretty fancy and I think the facelift um, you know did a lot of really nice stuff here and especially with the wooden decals here that is like a matte wood here you can also hear that um, that's really cool and still manual climate unit to be able to control it while driving a little bit better. Um, GPS hotkey I also like to have it you know very well reachable here and this lower part you slide open and you have a USB-C port now for your smartphone, for the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto connection, but also an inductive charging bed, but it doesn't make any sense if you don't have a wireless connection. Some cup holders, and last but not least, in the middle part here, typically the slides open, and then two more USB-C devices underneath with some decent space, and they're going all the way USB-C now, definitely. And now to those digital instruments here, yeah, we can also <laughs> rev it up then, right there. And interesting thing is here, for example, you can you know have the fuel economy then right there this is our realistic fuel economy at the moment and then you can also have some GPS input here if there is the road map then you also see a more sophisticated stuff in there um, you can change this head-up display settings or also the complete design of this one here for example to sport your gauges like this and also progressive and the cool thing is here in the GLC it loads way faster than in the E-Class or in the GLE with the digital instruments probably because it's a little bit easier set up or something but like it, it's you know more progressive and the head-up display right there the speed you can also see the allowed speed and also some GPS information so it's a very nice option and the speed itself is the crispest clearest one of that part the other parts may be a little bit out of focus from time to time, but overall it's still very helpful. And some more details about this screen. For example, let's take a look at the GPS up close. So it's a nice visualization. Also zoom in and out. And usually also quite responsive. And the Apple CarPlay inter integration looks like this. Does not use all the way of the screen, but mostly the CarPlay is also not the widest screen format. And this optional Burmese sound system here delivering a very crystal clear sound um, awesome the 3d sound system uh, which is available for the e-class or the GLE is a little bit better even but this one here already at a very very high level they go back to the normal Mercedes model uh, Mercedes menu and here for example you can also check some engine data if the engine is then on you can play around with that yeah here we go with the engine talk so a lot of things you can set and what's also very nice is you know this comfort features where in this case you even have optional again 
a massage which is very rare for this segment of course again a coast worthy option hmm that feels pretty nice it's nice yeah pretty pretty cool um, not exactly that cool as you would have in a GLE where you have like more single dots um, in there um, in the seat but it's already quite fancy but you can of course also live without it and the ambient lighting is also very nice that blue of course here you can see also something I mean, of that already in the interior can change the color right there and of course always brightness all the way up here yeah. the rear view camera is quite good as well too by the way also shows you those helping lines they adapt and then you also have this drone view from above but you can also set it to different views here on the right side like to you know all the way rear for example or that one here and I want to show you also another example of this one here so where the tires are being seen left and right for example if you approach a car wash and then you don't want to damage your wheels then you can really adapt that yeah that's cool right and also do the front view camera so but that's of course the optional most sophisticated camera system there is available and here you can always see that this car has air suspension because with this button you can raise the car for some situations where you need more ground clearance this one is a driving mode selector. I will also browse through that when we drive the car later on. What I also like is this upper light area because it has this crystal effect, you know, so pretty cool. And that's here where you open the panoramic roof like this. And as you see, it's split between front and rear. And there you can leave some more light in. And this is the cover, by the way. So there would also be a cover available for really, really hot days like this and then just press once more like this and here in the cover go through and same habits also for the rear now to the rear also with a nice soft touch article element on the inside doors and the matte wood that's awesome but with the sound system here as well and yeah it does exactly fit you know those gaps here in the back of the seat they are really helpful to give you some more knee room it does exactly fit then for four tall adults you should always raise the front seat a little bit that it's easy with your um, with your feet underneath and also headroom wise although this panoramic roof it doesn't go all the way over the vehicle it's split here in between but then you have another glass area right there so it leaves a lot of light in and then still some headroom left and it's actually quite cozy in here um, this is of course and if you compare the former GLK this one here works very well um, in the in the rear although it's not the best package so we have shorter cars and have more legroom but still you get along very well and it's also definitely decently comfortable back here what else do we have isofix at the outside parts each then you have a cubby hole underneath this armrest or cup holders in the front which you can fold out and you can also get a rear climate unit and also two USB-C supplies in the rear that's also new with the facelift here we go trunk can also be opened with a foot kick opening mechanism then you could actually lock this lower part that's pretty cool function then we have more storage underneath and that's pretty square dimensions and i really love this top cover which has rails on the side and it's a very very clean solution on the right side to flip the seat and also on the left side together with when you have the air suspension you can also lower the car just a little bit what I want to do first is give you the measurement to the normal seating area so this would be here then about 90 centimeters a little bit more in length whereas we have a little bit more than a meter in width and actually significantly more almost one meter and ten and this is really cool so good dimensions for this trunk also in the height here this is about 40 centimeters to the top cover and to the overall height this one here is about 75 centimeters and the cool thing is that when you put a cabin trolley right here in this trunk it is still possible exactly to close the cover here cleanly above it and now with the x3 for example that um, the cover here um, had to go a little bit lower right here in this area but it also, you know, had the um, additional height for the replacement tires. You should check that out to, you know, just to mention it. And then we also flip the other part. There's a very cool mechanism here. Usually also an option depending on the market. But then, you know, see everything is easily flowed and all goes all the way flat. And this one here is a little bit less than one meters and 80 in length. So overall, 
a very versatile car, I like that. Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge with the Mercedes GLC in this facelift version. And as I told you initially, I'm going to talk about how does it feel differently from the face from the pre-facelift. How does it feel differently from the BMW X3, one of the main competitors, and also from the Mercedes GLE, the bigger brother, if you're thinking about you know comparing those. And one of the changes here is that those two-liter four-cylinder petrol engines are now MHF, so mild hybrid systems. So with a battery that is bigger than a normal car battery, the eco mode, the throttle input is being drawn back and more attention to better fuel economy and so on, earlier shifting up and so and I can see if there's a power output from this MHF system or if there is this by the way the warning system here, the blind spot monitor and if I set the turning indicator then I also get an acoustic warning pretty good system and you already experienced that as for the assistance now so when I'm rolling down here now in the eco mode what's the car doing? it's recuperating a little bit but also rolling so it's more using a rolling um, if I go for example to, a com to the comfort mode it doesn't change so much as for the recuperation because it's still rolling if I go to the sports mode I have actually more engine brake because the car is, you know, a gear lower. And the interesting thing is, it's charging more. So, this is really interesting. I would have. Wait a minute, now it's. Hmm. But now it's charging more in the eco mode. So, not always sure why is it doing that way or that way because when we were at the beginning of the hill, the car wasn't charging that much. Maybe it's a thing that when the car realized we're going down it for a longer time or so, that then the recuperation set in, sets in. And this is really interesting because ah, now the charging is less again, and now we are in the sailing mode. This is very interesting. So the RPMs dropped to zero, and now we're rolling, and the engine is shut off. So, and this is a thing that is predominantly happening in this eco mode. So now we're sailing. Now what do we, increase the speed once again a little bit more that won't work that well when you are in the distronic in the cruise control mode by the way and I mean that's really interesting because the sailing or coasting thing is something that should be favored by this MHF system so that's the reason to do that and of course using the recuperation then to get you some electric boost I mean for performance reasons that's one thing and the other thing is also when you are you know getting started just from the traffic light that you can save some fuel by adding this you know electric power to it which was again gained from recuperation earlier so yeah definitely very interesting first impressions the question is always does it make a huge dif huge difference in the fuel economy overall and so far from all our tests we could say if you have a pr proper plug-in hybrid system with a good recuperation then this even made sense for the fuel economy even if you were not recharging all the time but those MHF systems with the smaller batteries on paper they were usually better but then in real life driving tests usually it didn't play such a role for the fuel economy and here as well so, well now in winter time, but even without using AC, we had numbers on, on long-term um, long driving, which were actually a little bit worse, worse than 9 liters or more kilometers, worse than 26 mpg US, 31 mpg UK. So that's already something good if you reach that, but usually the numbers were even a little bit worse. That is a little bit worse than we recently had with the BMW X3 with the two liter four cylinder engine. So the BMW engine seems to be a little bit more economical in this case, but not too big of a difference. And again, it doesn't seem that this MHF system would play a, you know, a major role. I will check it once again when we're finished with this round, definitely on the fuel economy. Other than that, the facelift didn't change much as for the driving characteristics. I mentioned earlier that there are different suspensions available, base suspension, 
off-road or bad road suspension which sits a little bit higher, sport suspension which sits a bit lower, and then we've, that's just a couple of hundred euros extra each, like 300 and 400. And then if you're going adaptive, like a little more than a thousand euros or dollars, then you go with the adaptive suspension, which is already a nice choice, definitely have more variety in the comfort and sportiness. And then this one, which we have in build here today, more than 2,000 euros extra, is the air body control. So this one is the air suspension. And quite exclusively also for this segment, the Audi Q5 does offer that, for example, too. Um, but the BMW X3, for example, not. Well, the adaptive suspension of the BMW X3 is really very, very good. So you're not missing an air suspension. And BMW has a very good compromise between sportiness and comfort. Here, so the, the, the compromise is better with the BMW. But here, the overall comfort is even a little bit better when you have the air suspension. So picking the air suspension would be one major argument for going with the Mercedes GLC because you know they have this very soft carpet ride like carpet like right so <laughs> and that's really something very cool you know if you own such a car for 10 years or so then you might think about yeah long-term repair costs on the air suspension that will get very expensive mm, if you're not afraid of that then you know you can go for it and I mean you have enjoyed great comfort until then or if you lease the car then it won't be um, such a problem in any way uh, yeah but this is something really cool, you know, to be in this mid-size SUV here and have such a very comfortable air suspension. This is really very, very cool. It's also pretty silent as for the noise insulation. That's also what I like about this car. It fits very well. The steering is pretty light, but still doesn't feel unnatural. So everything is transported to the road. There's no dead zone of the steering. It's pretty cool. And with this new infotainment system with the digital instruments in this facelift, it gives me also a more modern and more sophisticated experience when driving the car. So that's something where the facelift def definitely helped. If you are opting for that stuff, so that's not that it would come uh, directly as standard equipment. Yeah, we know that. That's what Mercedes does. They just want more money from you. That's the downside of you know, those even, even fancier things, definitely. So both BMW X3 and Mercedes GLC they are really excellent SUVs and definitely among the top in their segment in many, many ways. So again, I conclude BMW best compromise, sportiness and comfort, a lot of driving fun. I would say in the sporty sense, the X3 is a little bit more fun to drive. The GLC, however, top of the, of the, of the comfort, especially suspension wise, when you pick the optional air suspension here and then also better in the comfort overall, um, Again, but then it's not that sporty and doesn't, you know, it's not that much fun to drive it. It's still fun, yes, but if you compare it to the X3. And if you then think about, yeah, can it be a little bit sportier with, with the compromise? You know, the GLC 43, for example, which also has the air suspension, but is then set on a very stiff note, that I felt for everyday driving was too harsh. And we actually also got some customer feedbacks who said, like, you know, a test ride setup. Yeah, I experienced the same thing, Thomas, and therefore I went then, for example, with the GLC 300. Although, you know, someone wanted the 43, you know. So I think um, if you go for the high-end top sports model, you might want or expect this very harsh and stiff ride. But if you're going for those, you know, semi-performance models, I think you want a better compromise for your everyday driving. You want a little bit more power, but you still want the great comfort this car has to offer. And here again, I mean, it's... It's such a pleasure to enjoy this comfort here. Silence again, good noise insulation. The engine is very well insulated from the cabin. Yeah, that's that's really something really amazing. And it's really a very, very tough question if you ask me, GLC or X3, which one would I go for? <laughs> it's really hard, you know, the X3 is a lot of fun to drive. Mm. I really also like the you know, very central interior they have here, also again with the facelift changes. The voice input system, because here they put the newest one in. In the X3, there's a newer one available for the bigger BMW models. So this one here has the more sophisticated voice input system. And 
Mm, whereas X5 with this GLE, meanwhile I have the impression that the X5 is better built as for the interior quality. Here GLC with X3, I have, you know, I think it's the other way around. Um, the GLC somehow has, you know, better build quality to my, you know, subjective Im impression than the X3. And um, both, you know, definitely on a high level, but we also know, for example, where the GLC is being built in, in Germany, in, in northern Germany, which is, you know, they're, they're very good as for the quality over the past years. Um, and the funny thing is, like, just like one or two weeks ago, there was this German TÜV, so like, you know, the, where they do the annual checkups or two-year checkups of the cars, was this test, and the GLC was the winner in the best reliability index quality overall like not in the segment yes also in the segment of course but overall from all cars being tested whereas not but that's not the case with every mercedes car you know with the gle they had some quality um, problems they changed suppliers now for in in the production for for you know in the, in the us they brought were brought over to germany to to fix them actually so well, there was a hell lot of effort and so obviously they got new suppliers there now for better quality, but again, the GLC has been proven to be very reliable. If you have been a GLC customer so far, please share your experience. If it's good or bad, please just share your experience that we can either prove the point or maybe there's also something you know, which, which didn't go that well. We'd be really looking forward to that. And again, I don't feel like, you know, I need to rush things here. This is very smooth ride again so enjoyable and hmm, yeah those aspects i mentioned i really love the x3 but in this case maybe then it's the glc for me predominantly because i enjoy this very relaxing ride again when i go for the air suspension which i think i would go because that's also one of the unique selling points of this car again very smooth as for the steering wheel even though it's not the sportiest one upright seating position very comfortable on the long run and I can, you know, when I want to have the head-up display on, I'll just say, hey, Mercedes, head-up display on, and then it's already happy, happening, you know? What oh. can I do for you? Head-up display on. The head-up display is on. So, then, it was already on in this case, but, I mean, that's pretty cool. Natural voice input and some stuff you don't have to search in the menu, and that's already it. So that's also very, very well done. The engine is very silent, very calm, especially when you are in the, you know, in the cruising modes all the time. I mean, the MF changes, yeah, it's nice, you can have some recuperation, but it's not uh, like, a, like a major game changer. We've been running downhill now, um, now quite a lot of time, that, that's why the fuel economy is quite good at the moment. Um, but still, that's, you know, around nine liters, although we have been, what's happening here, it's an accident. So, um, although it was downhill, you know, a lot of times, um, that should be way better now, you know. So fuel economy, not happy with that. Would have expected more from this MF system. So, um, sports mode, by the way, when I, um, I mean, sports mode, there's no one here at the moment. Let's just accelerate a little bit, see how much power this car has um, for you. So let's just go. So that's 70 kilometers an hour already. That went quite quick, and the absolute figure to one kilometers or 62 miles an hour would be 6.2 seconds. So yes, very silent and refined this engine, but if you want the power, wow, you have it. And that felt to me even a little bit more spontaneous than the X3 I have just ridden like yesterday. Yeah, yesterday or like two days ago in the US. Um, maybe in this case, yeah, the, the MF is not that important for the fuel savings, but for the power boost. I mean, this one here has about 250 horsepower, but then, you know, they, they are a little bit more horsepower added by this, um, you know, by this MF system. So, this seems to work, actually, you know, with the um, extra electric boost. So, I was expecting predominantly fuel economy changes and not that it would change much in the power, but yeah, it seems all that I get the, all the EQ power at the moment now. But actually, it's the other way around. It's a very interesting finding of this driving part. So it's more obviously about power than about better fuel economy. 
pretty interesting. Yeah. And we had the same experience also with the Mercedes C class, which is sharing a lot of parts here, of course, with the GLC. That's why they also call it C. Um, also, the same result with the MF system that the fuel economy wasn't really that good, but again, for power, why not? And yeah, this Sport Plus mode, you know, really gives you some, some very decent output. Um, pretty nice, definitely. This one here and um, this car, by the way, also still a classic all way drive um, system. So, rear wheel bias as well. You also see that, for example, the GLC 300 is also available as rear wheel drive only in the US, but only in the US. But that's also, you know, always a hint that it's not front plus rear, but rather rear plus front, you know. But this one here, rather a classic all way drive, the real deal. And in Europe and Germany, you only can get this one here, the GLC, as all way drive. So let's maybe go to the normal comfort mode and have some more motorway ride here. And about, let's go to 100 kilometers. Getting on and also setting the cruise control. It's an adaptive cruise control built in here, so I can also set the distance to the car in front of me and then the distance is being kept, so it's pretty reliable. And we also have a lane keeping assist. Do not put your hands off the steering wheel. I'm always ready to intervene. Just demonstration purposes now. Professional rider don't attempt, like, you know, uh, disclaimer. <laughs> so here now the car already complains. I should put something at the steering wheel. But you see the car is being kept in the lane. So that's also done very well. And you should keep your hands on the steering wheel. And then it's a little bit more at ease. So definitely for longer motorway journeys, I can relax a little bit more here in the GLC. And probably at this point in this segment, it will be a little bit more important to me than sportiness. But maybe it's the other way around for you. Um, so pretty cool overall. Then to me, driving-wise, among the top in the segment, if not the best, especially if you think about comfort. Then, if you think about the GLE, the bigger brother, which I also recently drove, and so I can also very well compare that. Uh, we also had 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour, perfectly silent in this interior. This is also awesome. Good feeling also for the brakes, very natural feeling for the brakes. So how you can, you know, fine-tune that and then again recuperation is being used so for the GLE discussion bigger worth a smaller if you have the air suspension inbuilt in the GLC it feels like less of a difference because quite often when you compare those midsize against the full size that's the European definitions for you know GLC versus GLE X3 with X5 Q5 from the Audi versus Q7 then you feel quite often a very big difference because the bigger ones offer the air suspension and you have more of this like smooth carpet ride, whereas those ones here are yeah, not rough, but in comparison, you know, or maybe just off an adaptive suspension, which is already very good, but you feel that as a difference. Mm, this is even out here a little bit, so the riding comfort suspension-wise is almost equal to the GLE. What is different to the GLE is that in the GLE you sit higher, you have a little bit better overview because of sitting higher. On the other hand, the overview is worse when you think about how long and big the car is, you know, and the hood and so on. So here, for example, I can better watch over the hood, although I'm sitting not that high. So it's not entirely black and white. It's, you know, some there, some there. Um, this one here, of course, feels a little bit lighter, a little bit easier to control. You can ease it around the corners a little bit better. And GLE then again gives you a little bit more, you know, huge, sophisticated driving feel. So the question is how much money do you want to spend? How much space do you have in the city when parking, in your garage, in your basement garage, in front of your house or flat or something? So that could be a very crucial point. Um, and you know, because this one here already feels that comfortable. The funny thing is here also that GLC versus GLE, both are excellent cars, but maybe in this case here I would say I would take the advantages of having a more compact vehicle, a little bit more flexible in the city and so on in comparison to the bigger GLE. And because they're both set on the comfort, that I feel sportier in this one here with the BMWs 
they are sportier in general. So I don't feel the, you know, the urge to go for the smaller model there that it's sporty, you know. So the X5 still feels quite sporty for its size. Um, and therefore I don't miss the X3 sporty driving feeling, you know what I mean? Um, and the X5 also has a bigger difference in the interior build quality. Here with the GLC versus GLE, I don't see so big difference in the interior build quality. Whereas X3 with X5 is a bigger difference. So to me, between GLC and GLE, I would probably go with the GLC, save some money, be a little bit more flexible in the city. Between X3 and X5, I would rather go probably with the bigger with the X5 because, you know, more elaborate as for the functions, um, better infotainment system, better voice input, um, better build quality on the interior, um, more comfort yet not so much less sportiness. So that's also, you know, very interesting finding, you know, I'm, I'm discovering that myself at the moment as well, you know, so, yeah. So it's X5 and GLC. That would be you now my, my decisions then, uh, definitely. And yeah, uh, yeah, very interesting also to me for, for that finding. It's always cool to talk about the difference of, um, you know, you know of, of each of those cars. So then told you what is different with the GLC facelift, you know, just minor things driving wise and more the impression you get from those more elaborate things. Then again, general, how it's positioned in this segment and then talked about the difference GLC X3 and also the difference GLC GLE. Hope you really enjoyed this, you know, comparing insight for you today to make the driving path even more interesting. And please leave me your feedback in the comments also about those individual aspects and we'd be really looking forward also, which one would you actually go for, GLC or GLE, GLC or X3? X3 or X5. So let's exchange some opinions um, there in the comment section. We're really looking forward to read that. You know that I'm really trying to read every single comment, although it's like a couple of hours work per day and 365 year, uh, days. <laughs> yeah, yes, 365 days a year. So I'm really spending a lot of my personal time also in, in your comments, um, just also to give you a feeling that your opinion and you know your experience is really also highly appreciated here so and then has, let's head over to the final conclusion and now to our conclusion for the day with the mercedes glc here as the facelift exterior changes not that much of course yeah lamps new led standard is good yeah the daytime running light or i'd say like the signature in the Tail lamps also look more modern, a little bit cooler. Overall, an elegant design, definitely overall for the car. Interior, high build quality, and also vast choices of animal friendly material. That is really where they are leading, together with Tesla, of course, who made that standard anyway. Also, with those infotainment systems upgrades, this is also pretty fancy. If you go for that one, it's an option, yes. But the MBUX is gladly standard, so with this voice input and so on, this is really leading on the market at the moment. And also some decent space they have there, especially flexible trunk system. That's pretty cool when you have that electric flipping system, especially. Driving wise, so great, very well insulated. And wow, the air suspension is really so comfortable in this segment, leading in the segment to me as for the comfort. Yeah, maybe the Beam Lever X3, for example, is a bit more sportier fun. But this one here, the Comfort King then, as for that. Definitely one of the best cars over in the segment. And I also mentioned that in the driving part, recently at least for a German rating, you know, with the TÜV ratings. So where they check the cars <coughs> on, um, you know, mostly two or three year basis. This one here also scored the best result overall from all cars that have been tested. So it seems also to be a very reliable one. Then also, if you think about the engine, now with the new MHEV system, was a little bit disappointed that the fuel economy wasn't better, so that was actually one of the very few bad results about this review. However, the boost was a little bit better, so I felt that, you know, it was a little bit faster, more explosive as for the acceleration with this additional electric boost. So, for solving the fuel economy problem, that's maybe where the new PHEV could step in, the 300E, and I hope to test that one also at a later stage. Now, I'm also looking forward to your comments and also taught you a little bit more GLC versus GLE. In this case, this one here, especially with the facelift now, 
offer so many stuff that GLE is also offering that the difference between GLC and GLE is somewhat diminishing. Of course, there's some differences, also mentioned those, but has been smaller now. Now, <laughs> finished for the day. I hope I gave you a lot of interesting insight. Hope you enjoyed this episode together with us. And please also tune in to more relevant reviews. We have in the video description in the pinned comment like a GLE review, X3 review, um, GLC 63 review. We will also link those. So when you're finished with this video, you can also tune into other ones and maybe save them for later or whenever. Thanks so much for tuning in today, uh, especially to all long-term subscribers. So great to have you here. See you next time.